All right, welcome to everyone. I know that people are kind of getting into um, the, the listen only mode. We are recording tonight's session, so I do want to make you aware of that. Um, my name is Mandy now. I'm the executive director of Health Professions Week and thrilled to have each and every one of you here this evening. We have a very exciting panel planned for tonight discussing the application process for our Meet the Physician series. We have some wonderful physicians in the panel. Um, I am excited to welcome back Dr. Waters as our moderator. If you were with us earlier this spring, you'll know that she did a fantastic job moderating our first Meet the Physicians panel, so I'm thrilled to have her back. Um, just to kind of kick things off this evening, I am going to give each and every one of you a quick poll here. So if you would like to participate in our poll, you are welcome to do that right now. Um, we'll share responses at the end of the meeting tonight. Um, and I've got one more poll question for you later. Um, at this point though, I am going to allow Dr. Waters to take it away so that we can get to introductions. Welcome Dr. Waters. All right, thank you so much, Mandy. It's so great to be back and I'm really happy to be here tonight to um, join you all with this wonderful panel. So my name is Dr. Holly Waters. I am an assistant professor of osteopathic principles and practice at Nova Southeastern University College of Osteopathic Medicine at the Tampa Bay campus in Clearwater, Florida. Um, I work in uh, practice in osteopathic manipulative medicine and I also teach at the medical school. And one of my passions is helping to advise students on uh, admissions to medical school, uh, applications for residency, really just helping to help them find the career that is most suited for them and that's gonna be really give them the most fulfillment in their future. And so I love getting the opportunity to, to join in on uh, activities like these. Uh, we have a really wonderful panel with us tonight. And before I introduce the um, specific panelists that I'll be talking to, I'm going to uh, talk about the panelists who are here going to be covering the chat. Now, uh, we're gonna talk about a lot of different questions, many of which were submitted ahead of time that kind of talk very broadly, very openly about what the different health professions entail, what kinds of um, challenges and strengths that you'll, you'll really incorporate with each one. But um, a lot of the kind of like logistical nuts and bolts kinds of questions that you may have, those might be better suited to putting in the chat. Uh, so we encourage anyone who has a question that comes up, feel free to put that in the chat. Uh, and we have a number of chat panelists who will be helping to field those. So um, those chat panelists will include uh, Dr. Joanne Yanez, uh, a naturopathic doctor from AANMC. Um, we also have Jennifer Bassett uh, from AACPM, uh, and I know from AACOM, we have Regina Bowman Goldring and Dr. Helene Cameron. So, thank you so much to all of our chat panelists. I don't think I missed anybody who's going to be in the chat. So, okay. Um, and then in addition to them, we have our discussion panelists today representing multiple different professions. Uh, so I'll let them introduce themselves with just a quick little uh, intro question that I'm going to field to each of them. So um, if you could provide your name, where you're at, uh, your field of medicine, and what kind of career, sort of what is the balance of your career currently? Um, and so I'm going to start with Dr. Fodi, uh, who gets the privilege of going first because he is an osteopathic physician like myself. Hello, everyone. Uh, so yes, my name is Dr. Michael Fodi. Uh, I am an internal medicine trained physician. I did my residency at Greenwich Hospital in Greenwich, Connecticut. Uh, and I am currently a clinical assistant professor of internal medicine at Toro College of Osteopathic Medicine in Middletown, New York. Uh, and I also do um, inpatient hospitals work as well. Uh, so, but it's mostly the academic work that I do. So I'd say mostly like 95-5 in terms of the balance. 
All right. How about Dr. Jensen next? Thank you for having me. Good, good, after, good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Jeffrey Jensen. I'm the Dean at the Arizona College of Podiatric Medicine in, at Midwestern University in Glendale, Arizona. I uh, did my residency in Michigan after finishing my podiatric medical education, and then I was in private practice for 17 years before getting into education. Um, currently, I'm the Dean in Arizona and uh, really enjoying our time here, and uh, we just recruited our, our class for this, the year, so I'm uh, ready to answer any questions anyone has for the upcoming year. All right, Dr. Trevino, if you could go next. Hello, everyone. So I did my uh, medical training as well as uh, my PhD training at Rush Medical College in Chicago. And I did a pediatrics residency at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. And I'm currently a pediatric emergency medicine fellow at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus. And so this is kind of a, a next step in training for me in terms of a little bit more specialty um, driven care that I get to provide in the emergency department, um, but still very children's oriented. All right, and last but not least, Dr. Smith. Thank you, I'm Fraser Smith. I'm a naturopathic physician, so I also have a master's in training and development, and uh, I'm a professor and program dean of naturopathic medicine at National University of Health Sciences, just outside of Chicago. I do nutritional practice, uh, in this area, but more recently my focus has been on education. My interests are botanical medicine and cardiovascular prevention biomarkers for predicting risk. It's great to be with you tonight. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, okay, so now before we get into the next questions, uh, I'm going to have the Health Professions Week staff, if you could pull up the uh, application comparison chart. So for anyone who is attending um, this webinar today, they, you may see in your panel, um, your control panel on the side, that there's a couple of handouts. And one of the ones that you can access the PDF is the Health Professions Week Admissions Comparison Chart showing the different kinds of requirements that uh, are entailed for each of the different um, types of health professions that are represented here tonight. And this way you can kind of use it as just your, like your easy go-to go reference for um, how many schools there are, what kind of, what's the name of the application service that you go through, what, what admissions tests are required, fees, et cetera. Um, and so this might answer a lot of the really basic questions that you can have going into this. Uh, and you can have this for your reference and we can really focus tonight on the more kind of like big picture questions, like deep diving questions. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, and like I said, this will always be available on the uh, handout section of the um, uh, control panel for all the participants. So you can take that down now. Thank you. Okay, so getting into some of the questions about each of the professions. Uh, and each of the panelists go give us kind of a brief summary of what they think are one of the big appeals of their particular branch of health profession. Um, so how about Dr. Smith? Would you like to go first? You bet. Thank you so much, Dr. Waters. Um, you know, I think one of the great things about our approach is getting to spend a lot of our time on not only primary prevention, but helping people root out some of the causes of their, of their ill health and also work to optimize what's going on for them physiologically, nutritionally, structurally. Other professions do that too, but we get to focus on that a lot. We also get to work with a lot of patients that are also seeing others in medicine. So it's not an exclusive, exclusive approach, but it's very unique. And the students, uh, you know, students that are attracted to this often are very whole system thinkers and um, really interested in working with people. Uh, across multiple issues. So I think it's that whole person approach, but also optimizing physiology, optimizing resilience, that is what makes this a real a real pleasure for us. All right, thank you so much. Definitely uh, a lot of appeal in the naturopathic field. So how about uh, Dr. Jensen in podiatry? So podiatric medicine really specializes in all things foot and ankle. 
and we treat patients from six week old kids with club foot to geriatrics. We do lots of surgery. Um, when you come into podiatric medical school, you know you're going to get a three year surgical residency training program. And I think that's beneficial because many students, uh, they do want to know what they're going into and they want to know what their path is going to be going forward. So we're a smaller profession, with about 18,000 podiatrists in this country, about 8,000 of them currently are board certified in foot and ankle surgery. There's only 11 schools and uh, most of our students come in, they're interested in, in MD, DO or podiatry. A lot of them don't even realize podiatric medicine is its own application service. Um, I know I didn't when I went into podiatry. So uh, we have a lot of students uh, coming through that have options and, and they've chosen podiatry for the reasons I stated, uh, that the surgical specialty and they know what they're going to be from the beginning. Excellent. Thank you so much. I remember during my intern year, there were a number of podiatrists uh, that I would rotate with on the surgical um, rotations. And they were a great part of our team, so it was really great to have them. All right. Uh, Dr. Trevino, can you talk about some of the appeals of your field in medicine? Yeah, so when it comes to the allopathic application process and the MD side of things, um, I think what's really cool, and this holds true also for the osteopathic side, you know, you have a really wide range of specialties that are available to you. So you're talking about patient populations from those pre-birth to, you know, um, geriatric patients. You're talking medical specialties, surgical specialties, um, the whole scope there. I think the piece that really is attractive to a lot of people is the fact that when you're coming into medical school, you may have an interest, but you're going to get exposure um, in multiple fields and not have to really decide until that year three, year four point in terms of what specialty you want to you know, pers um, pursue for residency. And then even then, individuals may, like myself, pursue additional training after residency for more specialized care um, through a fellowship training program. And so there are ways to um, get to a lot of different areas in medicine and a lot of different routes to maybe get to the same point. Case in point, for my side of things, for pediatric emergency medicine, you could do a residency in emergency medicine. You could do residency in pediatrics. And there's even a combined residency program um, that exists. And all three of those ways can get you to this point of being able to care for pediatric patients in the emergency department. And so I think that's one of the, the beauties when it comes to um, the MD and DO side of things in terms of the options that are available to you. All right, thank you so much. And Dr. Foti, do you have anything else to add about osteopathic medicine? Of course. So yeah, I mean, uh, just as Dr. Trevino mentioned, the um, so osteopathic physicians um, learn as j just uh, the same that MDs learn in terms of uh, all of the medical knowledge that is needed uh, to be a physician, um, take the same licensing boards as well. Uh, in addition to that, I would say it's twofold uh, to become a DO or an osteopathic physician. Um, you learn a, a philosophy, which we, we you know, have multiple tenets that I won't go into all of them, but uh, basically when we, when we see our patients, you know, a big part of our approach is mind, body, and spirit. And we don't look at the symptom, we look at the person and other factors that might be involved in why they're coming to see us. And in addition, we also learn what is called osteopathic manipulative medicine, which is using our hands to manipulate the musculoskeletal system, which we believe not only can treat musculoskeletal disease, but also diseases of other organ systems, because we believe that the body can inherently heal itself as long as we remove those restrictions to the, to the healing process, basically. So you're learning that extra layer of medicine as well uh, that's at the foundation of uh, osteopathic physician. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so. When it comes to the kinds of career paths that we can expect for a student who's entering any of these uh, fields, um, I think it, it is well understood that in allopathic medicine, in the MD field, you go into residency and you go into the, all the different types of specialties. But um, I'd be curious to hear if the panelists uh, the other panelists have other things to add about the types of careers that one can expect um, 
for their particular profession. And actually, to maybe to start off with Dr. Trevino, what kind of career can one expect going into an MD PhD uh, career path? Yeah, so it, that's a really exciting option, I think, for people who find that they have uh, more of an interest in research. Um, and I want to point out with the PhD training, there's actually you know options for both MD PhD as well as DO PhD um, in terms of the dual degree aspect. Um, in both cases, what that training is going to look like is it's going to be a longer medical school time. So often up to seven to eight years of training in which you're going to get both degrees. Um, one of the key parts I think with this is you still have all of the residency options available to you. The reasons that people tend to decide to pursue that PhD training um, is they've shown a, an interest in uh, starting a commitment to research as part of their long-term career. And so they see the PhD time during their medical school training as a way to get more experience, um, both with leading projects on your own, grant writing, getting pieces shared in, in literature, um, and then a way to start to define what you might pursue in combination with your clinical career, what a research career could look like for yourself. And so there are definite ways to be able to do this. And even in residency now, we're seeing more and more tracks where individuals are able to have some uh, more dedicated research time in addition to their clinical training to be able to pursue these things to set themselves up for um, having strong research careers. The one caveat I do like to always make that when I talk about these dual degree sides is there are many physicians who are able to get NIH grant funding which is kind of in some areas like the top tier, top amounts of funding that they can get for the research. And they do that without having a PhD because the training that you get through your physician studies is a lot of clinical time that's going to give you the background knowledge that you need. And then what those individuals end up doing is using other time during their training, whether medical school or residency, or even post-residency training to get more research skills and have that strong background that puts them in a good spot for um, to be able to obtain grant funding. So I always say if you have a, that interest in research and you know that as an undergraduate student, then the dual degree option is something that's there, but by no means does it have to be the only way that you can pursue research in your career moving forward. And I think having that flexibility is a, a really cool option for this. And even for myself, I've actually kind of transit pivoted from the research that I did for my PhD training, which was more basic science oriented. And now my research career is probably going to be more towards uh, general education um, and community development type pieces. Wonderful. Sounds like a, a rich field for you. Um, so moving on to Dr. Foti, in the osteopathic profession, um, for our attendees here, can you tell what kinds of specialties are open to osteopathic uh, students as they pursue their uh, residency? Yeah, so um, just as MDs, we uh, can specialize in you know, any of the specialties that you may know, internal medicine, family medicine, pediatrics, emergency, all the surgical uh, specialties and subspecialties as well. Um, I would say that from my experience, there's definitely a propensity for osteopathic physicians to go into primary care. Um, I believe that that's definitely a niche that uh, osteopathic physicians have definitely been seeking to fill, um, such as myself. But I know many osteopathic physicians that have gone into uh, many different specialties, uh, orthopedics, plastics, surgery, um, e emergency medicine, um, et cetera. And then there's also a specialty um, that is uh, unique to osteopathic physicians, which is osteopathic medical medicine and neuromuscular medicine, which is when you can even further specialize in osteopathic medicine after getting that training that you've already got hands-on in medical school to even further so specialize and, and have osteopathic manipulative medicine as your specialty. And um, this actually you can get, you could do, you know, uh, osteopathic medicine and family medicine as well. And, and that's, uh, combined as well and kind of have a combined practice of the two as well. Excellent. All right, Dr. Jensen, I know we covered that um, podiatrists are definitely involved in some of the uh, surgical aspects of care, but what's the sort of different kinds of fields 
of practice that a podi uh, podiatric student can expect when they go into um, their further career. I think, I think when students are contemplating a career in podiatric medicine and they go and shadow podiatrists, one of the highlights for them is they see the different aspects of practice that different podiatrists uh, take on. So for example, uh, wound care is a, a big area for podiatry because of diabetic foot complications. Uh, podiatrists are in all the wound care centers around the country, working collaboratively, of course, with their MD and DO colleagues that are vascular surgery or infectious disease, uh, taking care of these high-risk patients. There's also specializing in sports medicine. Uh, the foot and ankle are the two areas where we see most of the injuries and chronic, chronic injuries for sports medicine. So some doctors will direct their practice in that regard. Um, I've worked with a couple of doctors that are the podiatrists for the Miami Heat and also for the uh, Los Angeles Lakers, for example. So really, most podiatrists are pretty happy with their careers because they can channel their practice into areas that they, they're well trained in and that they like to, to do. So um, I think it's inter interesting about research also. And I agree, you do not need a PhD to do research. I've had 10 NIH grants myself and some Department of Defense grants. and um, Mostly I've specialized in fracture care, wound care, and even infectious disease areas where we've put teams together. And I think it's important uh, that we all uh, work as teams collaboratively, and it's resulted for me in 14 patents also. So there's lots of different avenues as a podiatrist that you can have a career satisfaction, and it's certainly just not surgery, but it's always good to have uh, the ability to treat patients from a conservative perspective to a surgical perspective, so that all things foot and ankle can be taken care of in a podiatric medicine office. All right, the broad scope indeed. Dr. Smith, um, how about the scope for naturopathic doctors? I know it can, it can be quite broad, so please uh, elucidate that for us. You bet. Well, in some of our jurisdictions, the uh, naturopathic physicians can prescribe legend drugs, do minor office procedures like taking a biopsy, which could be in a big urban center, but sometimes in rural centers and they're, you know, filling that much needed role of uh, a family doctor. Uh, the recent survey by ANMC showed about 50% of us still have um, their own practice or a a tight partnership uh, with uh, a colleague as practice, and the other 50% are in some kind of group, small group or large group, and that's an emerging trend as well. And so many more complex practices want the services of a naturopathic physician. One interesting area is integrative oncology. I was just corresponding with a former student who's doing that work uh, this afternoon. So there's an oncologist or two at the heart of this practice, but there's other types of practitioners, and so they're, they're it's certainly naturopathic physicians, so they're helping patients with nutritional status, immune support, keeping their blood counts up, doing things that might even potentiate the um, chemotherapeutics that they're getting, or just at least help to disable some of the cancer's own defenses, and uh, these patients are fighting for their life, so there's this multi-pronged approach. And there's many other uh, areas that we get involved in, sometimes rehabilitative uh, medicine and sometimes environmental environmental medicine, allergy, and chemical sensitivity, which is a very, very broad field, but something that people are increasingly asking for help with. So yes, in some places, the scope has, uh, I've really seen it expand in my career lifetime. Excellent, thank you. And for the students listening, as Dr. Smith alluded to, uh, any one of these professions is often a member of a larger medical team. So it's no longer that you have a single physician working uh, in like a solo practice all that much often anymore. You're really part of a uh, broad, multimodal, large scope healthcare practice to really achieve the best for your patients. So there's a lot of really great options here for each, uh, for, for students who are interested in any different type of uh, healthcare tonight. Um, and so we're really happy to get to explore that a little bit more. All right, so I know that there's probably a lot of students uh, who are listening in who are really new to considering these options and they're not quite sure where to start. So um, I'm going to kind of open this up to anyone on the panel who wants to answer this question first. But what are your recommendations for somebody who 
has just decided that they want to help people and they want to do something medical related, but they're not quite sure what, what do you recommend? I'll take that one. I, I think it's important to shadow physicians. You know, if you have a, if you even remotely think you want to be an emergency department physician, you should go in and shadow those doctors. If you want to be a family practice physician, you should shadow them and see what they do day to day. Same holds true for podiatry or, or, or nurse practitioners or PAs. I think that there's no substitute for understanding what people do on a day-to-day -day basis and get their feedback on their profession. Right. Yeah, I agree. And I think, sorry, <laughs> it's also uh, in, in doing so, understanding the time commitment. So there's the time commitment uh, to the uh, medical school, time commitment to residency and thereafter, uh, and realizing that you really have to love this health profession to devote so much time to it. Um, you know, uh, it's, it, and again, once you've, once you've gone into your career, you can kind of determine how much time you want to invest after you've settled into your practice, but still it's, 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 it's a very significant time devotion to, uh, care for patients, to teach medical students, uh, and, uh, the combination of the two research. It's, 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 it's a big time commitment compared to many other professions out there. Um, and then also it's a big responsibility. You're taking care of patients. Um, and, uh, you know, being able to shadow, like Dr. Jensen said, will give you that perspective and realize, and again, it, on the, on the flip side of that, being able to help patients and, and, and build that rapport and having helped them in that responsibility is why we do this because it's so rewarding. You know, they put their lives in our hands and in that, that relationship of trust that you build with your patients is, is really, truly rewarding. And, um, that's why we devote this time to it because it, it really is. I think getting to know yourself is really important and that can certainly be using your advisor. Uh, it's not their decision, but asking family and friends helps to, to, to get to know uh, what what it really is that you like doing. Uh, so for instance, someone who maybe uh, doesn't want extreme pressure in their work, uh, they're, they're not going to uh, go down the road to, uh, you know, emergency surgery and things like that. Others that just love uh, a lot of control over their time, they're uh, going to go in a certain direction. And I, I think, you know, students come in knowing about Myers-Briggs and things like that as a self-test, which is which is fine and you can do on your phone and everything. But for, for some people, actually taking time to do something like an IMAP or Berkman method or something to really, really get to know where their interests are and where their needs are is a good thing, especially with the investment that we're talking about with all of our professions these days. It's a good investment in oneself, but it's a big investment. So I think that self-knowledge is really important. And I think to bring all these pieces together as, um, as an individual who's starting to apply, you really have to have that understanding of why you're applying to a particular health profession. And so when you're able to shadow and when you're able to have that insight about yourself, it creates, I think, a more robust application because I think we're past the stage of saying, I'm going to apply to medical school because I want to help people. Because the reality is all of these areas and health professions help people. So you have to be able to say why you want to be a member in that aspect of the team environment. And by shadowing, you're going to be able to say not just what that individual does in their role, but also what are the roles of other people? And you'll start to see how they interact in the team. And I think the direction that we've been heading over the last 10 years in applications is to really be able to define that. And it's not to say that as an, you know, as an applicant, you have to say, well, I want to become a pediatric surgeon. That's not what the expectation is. The expectation is that you can talk intelligently about your experiences that have led you to that point to say that you want to be a physician, that you want to pursue it as an MD or DO, you want to become a podiatrist and you can point to experiences that have helped highlight and shape that. And, and it's not to say that this is against any other field in the health professions, but it's really to promote why you want to go that direction. Because like you've heard, it's a lot of time. There's a big commitment that goes with this process. And so schools are wanting to make sure that individuals have that mindset for themselves. Um, and same thing when we talk about like the dual degree applicants, whether it's a PhD or a master's and MBA, they're wanting to see that you've shown some interest in those areas 
that's kind of pointing at why you want to get that extra degree in this time as well. Thank you so much. Um, kind of flipping that on its head, the next question that I'm going to have the panelists answer is what are some of the biggest obstacles that you find that students face uh, when it comes to preparing for your profession? I mean, uh, I would say, uh, oh, go ahead, Dr. Rina. I'll just bridge off of um, one of the pieces that we were just talking about, the getting those clinical experiences. It's becoming a very important aspect of your application, um, where more and more schools are not just saying, hey, do you have an experience, but how many hours have you put towards this? And to be honest, this is a hard part for students because it's becoming harder and harder to just find a physician and say, I wanna shadow you because there's different restrictions in place from, you know, from their practice, from their hospital systems, whatever it may be. And especially as we're kind of, kind of looking at everything in the aftermath of COVID in terms of changes that have happened, those experiences aren't there the same way that they were five, 10 years ago. So I think students have to think a little differently about how to get these experiences that it's not just shadowing, maybe it's trying to find ways to double your time um, being able to explore health professions through working is like getting a certificate piece so you can work as an MA or a CNA, um, being able to work as a scribe, get you experiences in different settings. So thinking about things in that way to get those, um, those clinical options or clinical experiences together is I think a challenge that we're seeing more and more from students to be able to meet the bar of what uh, places are wanting. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I think that's something that I've seen, too, in terms of students applying to medical school is how can they set themselves apart um, in what ways. And I agree with Dr. Trevino, it's, it's putting in that, you know, like myself, I, I, I worked as a scribe before medical school and, and I'm going to be worked as EMS and, um, and many other just showing that interest in, in, in medicine. But I think also, too, you know, when you get that interview invite and you go again, as someone who is uh, reviewing applications and also interviewing applicants, at the end of the day, we want to know that, you, first of all, we want to know you as a person. We want to know that you have passion for this at the end of the day. So when you show up to that interview, just be yourself. And if you're truly passionate about this, it's going to shine through and we're going to see it and we're going to know that you're here for that reason. We want to know you're here for the right reasons at the end of the day, because no one's 100% ready for whatever schooling they go to, you know, a medical school uh, or pediatric school or doctor path school, whatever, you're not ready. You're just, you go and everyone's on a level playing field at that point. Then you put in the work. The readiness is being ready to work and doing that. Uh, so just, you know, just be yourself and show that you really want to be there. That is all really well said, and I agree. Um, I always tell our students, uh, we know you're smart. You wouldn't be here if you didn't have the brain power to be successful, but you have to be passionate. You have to have time management skills, and you got to have the grit to carry on long hours, lots of information, lots of exams. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you all knew this, but uh, our school at Midwestern, we take the first two years with the DO students, our podiatry students, and um, it's it's a grind. There's no question about it. And uh, I always tell our students that the grind you experience in school is preparing you for the grind of practice, right? So uh, I think uh, that commitment and that passion and knowing really what you want to be is so, so important. And so I, I echo everything Dr. Trevino and Dr. Folke said. In naturopathic medicine, we want to see that people have uh, the, the capacity for doing a lot of different subjects or a lot of different things at once. It's not a sprint. It's not the 50 yard dash of a prereq. It's uh, very, like all these programs, very long, very integrated. But we also want to know people, that people know re really what it is that they're pursuing. And so we get a little concerned if they just looked at some websites. Interestingly, since COVID, people are showing up, flying in, showing up, and walking the halls more. But have they, like, again, have they uh, sat in with people? Have they shadowed? Did they take someone out for lunch and ask them lots of questions or become a patient? I think that's really important and it's harder to tell sometimes it really is whether an interview or writing but 
do they have the capacity to make a plan for how they're going to work their career and execute it and, and can they uh, can they communicate with people which you know we all we all want more of that um, and doctor patient communication is important but I think some students don't even realize how important that word is and so uh, you know in the short time we have to assess them before they come here I mean those things help their case and I have one other piece too, just to kind of also cover the elephant in the room because there's been a couple of questions around this. You know, we do recognize that for all of these pathways, the academic side is important. Um, and so this is definitely an obstacle. The challenges that we see individuals have when it comes to um, the coursework that you take in college to be able to prepare you. And it's not just to prepare you for the MCAT if that's what you need to do, um, but it's the preparation in terms of the amount of time and everything and dedication that you have to put towards the studies to be able to show that you can be successful for the amount of work that you're going to have in the next level of training um, in terms of what that looks like and it's not to say that grades are everything and by no means do we mean that especially as we talk about holistic applications in terms of looking at the applicant as a whole but at the same time you have to be able to show that you can kind of work through complex science that you can find a way to overcome obstacles. If it, one of those obstacles is the grades um, and study habits, then being able to work through that and find things because as you move on through this, whether it's medical school or residency, it's not that these things are always gonna be handheld for you because there's gonna be challenges that come up from the degree of the academics as well as the tests that still have to be taken. So lots of things for students to keep in mind, absolutely. Um, and so speaking of grades, if you are a candidate who is struggling with your grades, you're struggling with maybe your test scores or your GPA, what's something in your profession that a um, candidate can do to stand out and to really uh, strengthen their application uh, if there's like a weaker GPA or something like that? I can speak for our university, Midwestern University. We have a, a DO school and a dental school and the vet school and the podiatry school, but we also have a, a biomedical master's degree. And well, there's lots of candidates that come through applying to all the programs that might not quite have the numbers that that would make them an automatic entrant, right? So when they do take that master's degree, they get to take the courses that they're going to be taking uh, in very similar fashion, and they get to uh, get a feel for what it's like to have a lot of information coming at them at one time, as opposed to undergrad, where you might have one or two hard courses per quarter or semester. So uh, I think the, the biomedical science and then master's degree programs do, do help cover up some of the and, and, and some people just need to grow up, right? Their grades weren't great when they were freshmen in colleges or something. But uh, I think that does help them become a more competitive candidate. Yeah, I think too, um, so like for myself, you know, I had a good GPA, but my MCAT was not great at all. Um, you know, I struggled with standardized testing early on. But I know something that set me apart on my interview uh, was that I had worked as a scribe uh, in an emergency department. So they did really like that. Um, and I did my research about osteopathic medicine. Um, you know, I really, you know, I didn't just, you know, read a single website. I really looked into it and I did my research and, you know, like I said before, shown that I really wanted to be there and, and become an osteopathic physician. So um, showing the interest, showing that you could do stuff outside of the normal day to day, um, you know, such as doing those other, you know, outside shadowing or other type of um, things that we talked about earlier um really can help you set you apart as well i think those prep situations are helpful and many undergrad uh, uh transcripts will show us well you know they had 12 credits at a time maybe 14 or 15 and uh having some evidence that you can take 25 26 28 credits at a time um which partly has a lot to do with um, time management skills. And I don't recommend people divert just to the private sector when they're right on their game with studying and an undergrad. But when we do see people coming in and they say they're a research coordinator at Rush University here in Chicago or something like that, we, we know that they, um, 
can process a lot and they can have a lot on their plate. All right, so um, now some of the other parts of the application. What, uh, is, what does research look like as a component for applying or preparing for your profession? Is it required? Is it recommended? Is it considered at all? Um, so panelists, if you could talk to your specific part of medicine. I would say it's definitely recommended. Um, you know, research is a big part of uh, being a clinician because it's how we determine, um, you know, how to cure diseases. It's how we determine the best surgical approaches. It's how we determine the best uh, um, medicines that, uh, or, you know, new medicines that are coming out and the best medicines for certain diseases is all through research, really. And so understanding the research process uh, is big. So if you do research uh, as an undergraduate, you've shown that you have at least have a base knowledge of whatever statistical analyses that we need to know as a, a researcher and just how to go through the research process, the steps that are involved, because it actually is a big part of being a clinician. Even if you don't do research as a clinician, once you get to that point, you need to know how to read that research because it affects your practice. Uh, you need to know how to, to really to digest it and understand it uh, as well. So I think that uh, being in within a research project to get you that first day experience. It's not a critical application uh, aspect for ND um, in that we're looking at academic aptitude but we want to see um, an openness to it and some aptitude to it because, because they're going to have to use it. There, there's going to be some treatments our, our interns give that are very consensus driven, but many that, like, like many practices, they have to synthesize things about this particular patient, some things they know about biomedical pathways, and then some degree of clinical trials. And you have to be very literate in reading research of different levels even the rigorous replication of traditional therapies that's kind of a different type of empirical evidence so um we it's certainly a uh uh red flag for us uh if we see that uh someone is really uncurious about this it, it it's not a good indicator for how they'll fare down the road For us, for our application process, uh, I've noticed over the years that students that have come in from undergrad and having done research, it's like icing on the cake for them because it, they've taken the curriculum, they've taken the prerequisites, and on top of that, in addition to other extracurriculars, they've been able to do some research and that bodes them well for doing more research at school, which sets the stage for doing residency programs. So I think uh, research is an important component, but it's uh, people get exposed to it at different times. And from the allopathic side, you know, we're seeing um, more and more applicants are having a broad set of experiences coming into medical school. That's not just the community service and leadership, but also research. Um, the AANC used to put out these um, brief reports called analyses and briefs. And I remember one that was now probably about 15 years ago that showed at that point applicants to medical school um, the ones who were getting in, there was like 60% of them who were having research experiences. And I can tell you just anecdotally that that number is going up. Um, where it's at exactly these days, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, I was trying to find it quickly, but it's becoming a part of the kind of expectations from an allopathic side. And not necessarily to say that the expectations that you're running your own experiments and doing these pieces, but it's just one part of the experiences that you bring in um, for everything that we've talked about in terms of the role that research plays in your medical career. All right, so when um, when you've completed your application, when you've gotten ready uh, to prepare um, to start your interview and you're starting to get those interview invites, what would you say is important to um, Keep in mind that you're trying to convey during the interview process that can really help you stand out uh, for your profession. 
I think the two most important questions to ask yourself that you will be asked on interview day um, is why are you here? Meaning why are you sitting in front of me doing this interview, right? We're not gonna ask it at, in that way, but to, to, to be blunt, yeah, why, why this profession? Um, and two, why us? Meaning whatever medical school or podiatric school or ND school, why us? You know, that, that's the two things that, that any uh, uh, health profession school wants to know. Uh, so you definitely ask yourself this question. It's gonna take a lot of introspection. Um, and that's the most important thing because as, as someone uh, who works in a medical school, we wanna know that you wanna, you know, do this profession and you're passionate about it. And you're passionate about us as a medical school that you wanna be here. Because especially for osteopathy physicians as I mentioned earlier, we do have a greater propensity to go into primary care. And a big part of primary care is working in your community and building trust and relationship with your patients and serving the community. And a lot of our graduates go and serve our area and, and become uh, big parts of the primary care community here um, in Middletown. And so uh, I think it's very important. And so uh, we wanna know that um, you care about the profession and where you're applying. I think really important as well is to know your story and um, the work that you're going to put in before you get to that interview in terms of how you craft your story through your entire application is going to be an important part of what helps get you in the door. But then it's also going to be a part that helps set you apart when you're talking with individuals. So not just saying that you know the experiences of what you did, but being able to show how that impacted you, how that led you to this point of deciding that you wanted to become you know, this health profession um, and being able to kind of keep that narrative going through all of this so that when they go back at the review, they look at your application, they look at the interviews, they see this very tied together thread of, okay, this is who this individual is. They have this sense about their interests and what they wanna do. And that may even come with they know what things they're not sure about and what they want out of this experience, um, which can be just as helpful as helpful to schools when they're looking at this. But that's one way to really help sell, um, have yourself set apart during the interview process is by just knowing what that narrative is that you're trying to make sure they take away. It's hard to add to those. Those are excellent, excellent answers. Um, what I do like to ask students though is, can you give me an example of leadership uh, qualities uh, that they've attributed to whatever reason, and it doesn't have to be in medicine. And also I like to ask about time management skills because uh, sometimes you come in with students that just sailed right through undergrad and they've got a 3.8 and they did well on the MCAT, but it's gonna be a shifting gears once they sit in the seats and the rubber hits the road that first week of classes. We, we like to know that if we're letting someone into the this next stage, we're we're not going to regret in the future that we invited them into this small profession and then to be around vulnerable human beings. So we want that good conscience or good karma around that. And obviously, you know, as a smaller profession, in some ways an emerging profession, we think about how they're going to represent us. So in their interview, they they come across as that it's all about them or um how amazingly successful they'll be, or it's very pl platitudinous, what they're saying, you know, it's not a pageant. We're not looking for, you know, so much your ideals, but are, are they really interested in helping people who are at their, sometimes the lowest point in their life? And so we look for those sorts of hard things for the people because um, it's a big step once you're into medical school of any kind, you know, there's a very good chance you're gonna get out of medical school. So we care about who we're inviting into this. Thank you so much. The, these answers are really helpful because, you know, it shows how students how to put them forward authentically so that they can really show their best qualities and find a school that really um, relishes those good qualities. So, uh, in terms of, say, a personal statement, what are some of your favorite things that you see in personal statements that you read from students applying?
or you can say we think weird things too. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll jump in early this time. Um, I really do love it when there is a personal experience and you don't have to have um, had your health upended to become a good doctor. So it's not that so much, but just when they've had something happen, they're, they were a vet and some things happened that set them back or they were cured of Hodgkin's lymphoma as a teenager, but when they had to rebuild their body and they'll always talk about, it could be their medical doctor or their osteopathic physician, um, their, their, their podiatric surgeon, someone like myself, but when they, they talk, they talk about how much that person meant to them. They understand what a what a big part a doctor like that has to play in in helping them rebuild their body. So, you know, we we love those, but we don't try to be too biased towards it because a lot of our applicants are 24 and in absolutely radiant health. But but not everybody. Yeah, I would say definitely sharing the experiences that led you here. Uh, because there's some sort of experience or experiences uh, that led you uh, to apply. And that's what that's what I care about at the end of the day to hear. Um, and again, it doesn't have to be something medically related, whatever it may be. Um, I've heard many, many different stories uh, um, that led someone to want to go into the health profession, many of which had nothing to do with the health profession, but it led them there. So uh, I just want to know why you're here, because that will show us that whether you'll be successful in this profession. I, I found that personal statements will give us a good indication about an individual's empathy and uh, caring and compassion. And I think that just sees through in many personal statements. And I, I like that. I, I like to see that in their application. And I think your personal statement's a great way to showcase um, some skills and strengths that you have and to be able to use that in the context of your activities and so this becomes a great place to not just it's not a, a tell me what you're able to do but show me show me how you know these different experiences have led you to this point and that may even be highlighting how your job as you know a waiter impacted how you interact with individuals you know for me it was talking about my role as a teacher because I, I taught middle school before um, becoming a physician and so that played a big part of my application and but it was meant to highlight some of those strengths that I felt were characteristics that overlap between education and medicine and so the personal statement becomes a really good way um, to be able to highlight that and for those applying for um, MD and DO your secondary applications is kind of another way to um, to show those pieces as well all right thank you so much so I'm going to do one more question uh, before the, we close this out. And I want each of the panelists to share something from their pre-health career that they would have either done differently or that they would have advised themselves to do differently. Um, and to help you guys out, I'll start with myself. I, I think what I would have done is not wasted so many years doubting myself after I was discouraged by one very particularly negative advisor um, and who thought that I didn't have what it take, took to go to medical school. And I would have told myself, go find out what it takes to go to medical school and go be that. Um, and I might've, I might've, might've saved a few years there. <laughs> I have a very specific example, but I, uh, you know, I, when I was preparing for the MCAT, I signed up for a, co a course to, 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 you know, to prepare. And what I shouldn't have done is I signed up to do the course in the middle of my, uh, it was the second spring semester of my junior year of college. So trying to do the course at the same time doing all my other courses in college. And I really did not put much of any time into the NCAT course. So it really pushed me back a whole year and a whole year may not be nothing, but it, you know, it, it, it was, it was a waste. I would recommend if you're going to do a prep course, I mean, know yourself if you're able to. I know myself, I wasn't able to do a prep course while also doing my courses for college. It was just too overwhelming, um, especially junior year, you know, being a biology major, there was a lot of uh, tough courses at that time. Um, so, you know, maybe do it during an off time, you know, the summer or something like that um, is what I would recommend. Uh, 
I have an interesting story in that I didn't know what I wanted to be when I was 18, 19, 20 years old. And it wasn't until I was working on my master's degree in exercise physiology that I realized, yeah, I could become a doctor. And that's when I took organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry and physics. So I think it's I think it's good advice for uh, anybody out there listening that sometimes you don't hit your stride when you're 18, 19, or 20, and it's okay. And uh, when you, uh, for lack of a better term, when you grow up to be the person perhaps that you're meant to be, then you, when you get focused, anything's possible. But it's hard when you're younger sometimes. So uh, be, uh, be, be forgiving of yourself if, if you didn't know exactly what you wanted to do when you were 18, 19, 20 years old. I had an uncle who told me before I applied for this, you know, knock down the walls of your limitations and just go for it. And I kind of did, but I, I like to play it safe a lot and not look bad. And then after medical school, like one day I decided I wanted to learn how to sail. So I took an intensive sailing camp evenings and weekends and I uh, was terrified at first and then got really good at it. But that's who I was after this process. But I would say, um, don't worry about how perfect you're going to do anything. Uh, just sign up for something you never thought you could do, or that's, oh, other people can do that. Don't be reckless. You don't have to go to Mount Everest and, uh, you know, I'm going to sign up for uh, Camp 2, uh, will myself on. But do something out of your comfort zone um, and get used to that feeling of um, going a little beyond what your own self-image is in because there's a lot of that in the future, but um, that's what I would would tell myself then is, oh, you know, just go for it. If you fall down, you'll just get back up again. And my last piece is I would say is be open to opportunities. Um, believe it or not, I, you know, while I have a PhD, I actually didn't have any research experience in undergrad. And it was largely because I just didn't know what that meant and didn't have a great understanding. And so there are opportunities that I passed up because I just didn't know how to ask the questions that were gonna be interesting to me. And then likewise, I found that I create, made things harder for myself oftentimes by being stubborn and thinking that there were a lot of pieces I had to do on my own. You know, for applicants these days, there are a lot of resources that are out there. So one piece is you have to, you know, kind of weed through the good and the bad. And all of our professional organizations are going to be kind of your first point. And resources like Health Professions Week is another great way to get that right information. But recognize that there's a lot of ways to get to these endpoints. And thinking that it's one path that you have to do can really create some problems for yourself if you think that you have to overcome everything on your own. So looking for those resources, asking for help, and Kind of recognizing that uh, it's it's a journey to get to this end. All right, that's really wonderful. Thank you guys all so much for sharing. Thank you, Dr. Smith, Dr. Jensen, Dr. Pody, and Dr. Trevino. Uh, I know we have a few comments uh, from the Health Professions Week staff before we close this out. So, and thank you to all the attendees who took time out of your busy evening to come listen to us share what we we find passionate about our careers. I am, I was on mute. I made the cardinal zoom so, sin. I apologize. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I, I, you guys were so fantastic tonight. We answered a lot of questions in the, the chat tonight. So thank you for everyone. Um, I told you I had a poll at the end. So I am putting the poll up. And so I want all of you to share with us, um, what did you learn the most about tonight? I was gonna say, we heard, we heard so much information. We shared a lot of information in the chat. So this is absolutely fantastic. Um, I also want to let you know, I put two handouts that you guys can download. It One is that application comparison chart. So feel free to grab a copy of that. The next thing that I'm gonna share with you as soon as I close the poll, I'm going to give it just another five seconds. Five, four, three, two. Oh, wow, a lot of you are voting. Fantastic. Um, because I do want to share with all of you, if I can figure out how to do it, um, 
is what we have coming up. And what we have coming up, hopefully everybody can see this. Let's make sure. Um, Dr. Waters, can you give me a yes or a no? You can see the upcoming events. Nope, okay, hold on. We have a thumbs down, that is not good. Show screen. Okay. Fabulous. Fabulous. You are all invited to come to our next two events. We will be hosting a Guess Who panel. This is a super fun event. We get some current students together, but we don't tell you who, which profession they represent. They get one minute to describe what they do. Um, and then you all get to vote on which ones you think match the different professions that Health Professions Week represents. So join us on October 25th. That one's at 3 p.m. Eastern, so a little bit earlier in the afternoon. And then I'm just on behalf of, of everybody here tonight, I'm really excited to announce that our next Meet the Physicians um, webinar will be November 8th. We will be hosting careers in surgery. So for all of you with questions about surgical professions in the chat tonight, you are cordially invited to join us in November for this session. Easy one-click registration. All you need to do is grab this QR code, use the email that you used to register for a the tonight's event um, and it'll be one click registration so you are all welcome to do that um, as soon as we close the broadcast tonight the link will be available um, shortly thereafter to you you should get an email with that link so that you can watch it we'll also get it posted to youtube so thank you so much everybody i am going to stop showing my screen and just a round of applause to everybody tonight thank you so much everyone i appreciate all of you so much and i just want to say good night and uh, we'll see you all very soon good night everyone thank you good night thanks everyone thank good you night.